May the Lord bless you. I'm ready to worship. Uh, let's stand to greet each other at this time. sing together. We're together again. We're together again. Praising the Lord. We're together again. In one accord. Something good is gonna happen. Something good is in store. We're together again praising the Lord let's do it one more time we're together again praising the Lord we're together again in one accord something together again, praising the Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come if you would, and let's take this time to go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord's blessing on this offering this morning. We're glad you're here. It's a beautiful day to come to worship the Lord today, and Brother Ronnie White is going to come and lead us as we pray. May we pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's good to be back in your house today. Lord, thank you for health and strength. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for the freedom we have to worship. ask you to bless those in these ones lost loved ones, the ones that shut ins, the ones in the nursing homes. You know each and every need. Lord, I ask you to be with our church and our church family. I just ask you to bless this offering. May it be given to glorify your name. We ask all these things in thy name. Amen. Psalms 100, verses 1 through 5. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth for all generations.
Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the hour of his name. Make his praise glorious. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee, and my soul which thou hast redeemed. Would you stand with us, please? That wonderful chorus, Lord, I lift your name on high. Let's sing this a couple times through this morning as we open the service with our music this morning. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save. your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That little chorus simply says his name is life. His name is Master, Savior, Lion of Judah, Blessed Prince of Peace. And what a fitting scripture when that passage of scripture in verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Let's sing this little chorus together. If you're not familiar with it, we'll sing it twice through, and uh, maybe you can catch it on the second time. We've done this a couple times before. It's called His Name is Life. Wonderful little chorus. Let's sing together. His name is Master, Savior, Lion.
therefore I give, give to you understanding that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His name is wonderful, followed by He is Lord. Let's sing this together. His name is wonderful. His name Say amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. Before Susan comes to sing, I do want to uh, uh, clear something up that uh, the name Deborah Darnell is in the bulletin. She will not be singing for another couple of weeks. That was my mistake. But uh, So Susan's going to come and share this time, and I've got Deborah scheduled to come back, so we're looking forward to hearing her as well. So Susan, you come and share with us. Throughout 
the universe displayed then sings my soul my Savior God to together. Fathers, we join our hearts together this morning. We thank you for a beautiful Lord's Day. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to be back in your house. I pray that uh, everyone that has made their way to this service uh, will be able to say at the close of this service, they're so glad they were able to be here in God's house today. I pray that you will teach us from your word, and uh, Lord, I pray we will take to heart what we hear today. I pray that you will speak to the lost and you will speak to the saved. And, Lord, that you will just bless us today as we bless you for who you are and all that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you today. Hope everyone is doing well. I am excited. Um, we're going to embark on a little journey this morning. We're going to embark on a new series of messages on the subject, financial wisdom. Uh, if there's ever been a time in my life when I believe Christian people, really all people, need to have great wisdom in the area of financial management, it is now. You know as well as I do that our nation is in trouble financially. And uh, there are many uh, people in our nation that are in trouble financially. And uh, certainly people are in trouble, maybe because they are unlearned, uh, maybe because they're violating God's principles. 
Uh, but the fact remains that every single person needs to have wisdom in the area of, of finances. And it's interesting that, um, you know, I am not, and I want to just say this up front. I said this to the early service crowd this morning, and I'll say it to you. I do not pretend to be an expert at anything especially in the area of financial management. However, I do know the person that is, that listen, he is an expert at everything. And his word contains a lot of information about money and financial management. I had the privilege back many years ago, this was back in the late 1980s, I had the privilege of doing an in-depth Bible study that was... Uh, uh, material was put together and compiled by Dr. Bill Bright. And uh, the study was, uh, we had a workbook. Actually, it was a thick, huge book uh, called Men's Manual Volume 2. And uh, I learned so much about financial freedom during that study. It was a real, really in-depth study. And so this morning, uh, we want to kick off this series, and I'm going to be sharing with you from God's Word. I'm going to be sharing some things with you even this morning in the message from Dr. Bill Bright. I'm going to be gathering and gleaning information from a lot of different sources, uh, people who know much more about financial wisdom and financial management than I do. And so I just hope and pray this series is going to be a blessing to you. That is my prayer. I've been wanting to do this series for months now. And, and the Lord just has not given me freedom to do that. But as you know, tonight, and I want to encourage you to be here tonight because our stewardship team will be doing a presentation and sort of giving you an update to where we are in our 4G campaign and uh, be challenging us, by the way, um, regarding our finances and uh, since we've kicked off this campaign to raise monies for our building program. And so uh, I just felt that now is the time to begin this new series and I trust it will be a tremendous blessing to you. And I, I want you to know it's not all going to be about tithing. I know when I told the early service cry this morning, I said, usually when a pastor stands up and says, I'm going to be preaching a series about money, they stand off. And sometimes people don't even come because, you know, that's an area in which some people are weak and some people are disobedient. And as a result, they just don't want to hear things about financial wisdom or about money. But I, I assure you that this series is going to be more than about money. It's going to be about our spiritual lives. And listen to me carefully now. How you and I manage our money speaks volumes about who we are, who we know, and how we're walking with God. I didn't hear the first amen. But that, thank you, my dear brother. But that's the truth. You know, there's nothing any more precious to people than their pocketbook. And so this morning, we're going to embark on this journey. And I hope it's going to be exciting. I hope it will be good. I hope it will be interesting to you. And I hope it will be a blessing to you. And so I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Now, I believe the first step... Uh, to gaining wisdom in the area of, of financial management is understanding a foundational truth from God's Word. And that truth is this, that, listen, that God is our source of true wealth. And that's the title of this message, is Our True Source of Wealth. Our true source of wealth is the title of message one in this series. And I want us to look at this scripture passage together. Now, it's a rather uh, lengthy scripture reading, but I want you to be able to put it in the context of what's going on here. And so read along with me beginning in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Now, remember, God is speaking to the nation of Israel. And he is reminding them in verses 1 through 6, he is reminding them, really exhorting them to remember the wilderness wanderings. And he's reminding them that he is the one that, listen, that led them out of bondage from Egypt and led them through the wilderness. He is the one that provided for them. He is the one that protected them during that time. So let's continue to go on and read now. Verse 2, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or no. 
And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and are full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast hast is multiplied then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought where there was no water who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint who fed thee in the wilderness with manna which thy fathers knew not that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end and thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Watch verse 18 now. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Did you hear that? It is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may obtain, establish his covenant which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face shall ye perish because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. So God is giving them words of instruction, reminding them of how he called them, how he has led them, how he's protected them, how he has provided for them. And he warns them against two things that every single person should be warned against. Number one is pride. He says there in verse 11, excuse me, verses 10 and 11, he says, when thou hast eaten and are full and you've been blessed and by the good land that God has given you, he says, beware that you forget not the Lord. He says, when you've eaten and, and, and God has multiplied you and, uh, with all these good things, multiplied these things in your life and you've been blessed, he says, look at verse 14. When then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. He's warning them against pride. You see, that's what prosperity will do. It will, it will so overwhelm us that we forget God. And God is saying to the nation of Israel, I'm warning you, when I bless you in the land of plenty, the land that is flowing with milk and honey, he said, whatever you do, don't forget me. Don't become prideful and, and say, I'm the one that has gotten these riches. Listen to what he says down in verse 17. And say in your heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. And so he's warning them against pride. He's also warning them against a spirit of independence whereby they stop depending on God and start depending on themselves. Up until that point, especially during the wanderings in the wilderness, guess who they had to depend on? They didn't have food to eat, so what did God do? He ran down manna from heaven. Uh, the Bible tells us that they were thirsty. He even reminded them this, reminded them of this, that he fed, listen, he gave them water out of the rock of Flint. And so God was the one that provided for them. God is the one that was protecting them. And God said, whatever you do, do not forget me. Why? This one reason. Listen, because God is the one that gives us the power and the strength to get wealth. Look at what he says, verse 18 again. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. And so God is our true source of wealth, bar none. 
And so this morning, there's only one main point in this message, and here it is. We're going to consider one thing this morning as we think about God being our true source of wealth. And here's our consideration, and here it is. Why should you and I as Christian people consider God as the source of our wealth? Why is that? Well, I want to give you four good reasons why that is true. Number one is this. Look in our text again in verse 18. I take this from verse 18. Number one is that God is, listen, God is the source of all things. He's not only the source of our wealth, but God is the source of all things. You see, He is our Creator. He is the one that has created everything. Now let me give you four verses of Scripture, okay, or four passages. Acts 17 verse 28 says this. Now think about this as we think about God being our source of all things. Number one, Acts 17, 28 says, For in Him, that is in God, we live, we move, and we have our being. Do you understand this morning that the reason that you and I are here and we're breathing the breath of life, that our heart is pumping and our lungs are expanding and and we're able to breathe the breath of life is because of God? It is only by the grace of God that you and I were able to wake up this morning, that we were able to get dressed and come here. Do you know that there are a lot of people in our area, in our own church, that could not be here this morning because they're physically ill and they could not be here? That You and I are here today because God has allowed us to be here. You're not here by accident. You're not here by coincidence. You are here because you got up and made a willful decision this morning to come here, but you are here by the grace of God and that God gave you and me the physical ability and the mental capacity to be here this morning and to be sitting here listening at His Word. It is because of God. It's all about Him because it is in Him that we live and that we move and that we have our being. If we're not for God, you and I would not be here today. Secondly, in Acts 17, 25, listen to this verse. It says, neither is, and I'm inserting the word God because in the context of the verse, that's exactly what the writer is referring to or who he is referring to. He says, neither is God worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath, and listen to this, and all things. He says God not only gives life and breath, but God gives all things. Did you know that not only, listen, that we're here not only because God has given us grace and mercy and this physical strength that we have to be here, but do you know that everything else that we have belongs to Him? And everything that you and I possess and have in our possession today, it's not ours, it's all His. And everything that you and I have is because of God. The money that you and I have in the bank, it's all because of Him. The the food that you and I have in our cupboards at home, it's all because of Him. The clothes that you and I have on our back and the shoes that we have on our feet, it's all because of Him. Everything that you and I have is because of God because He is the source of all of our wealth. You say, well, preacher, I'm not wealthy. Listen, if you've got health and strength to be here, you have some wealth. If a person has their health, they are wealthy people. Because believe me, I go in the hospitals every week and I see people that are dying with cancer, that are dying with heart disease, that can't get up out of the bed. That Listen, I'm telling you, if you have good health, you have a lot to be thankful for. uh, Excuse me, James 1.17, listen to this verse. It says that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no verilmanness, neither shadow of turning. That means that God is immutable, that He never changes, that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But it also says in that verse that every good gift and every perfect gift that you and I receive in this life all comes from the hand of a loving and merciful and gracious Father who loves us and gives us all of these things. Everything we have, it's all because of Him. And then finally, Haggai chapter 2 verse 8 says, listen to this verse, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. You know what that tells me? That tells me that no matter what our need may be, God, listen, He owns a cattle on a thousand hills But I want to go further with that and say that he even owns the hills that the cattle are on. God owns everything. 
And if God owns all the silver and if God owns all the gold, then listen, do you understand that as individual members of the body of Christ, if we are walking in obedience to God and we're trusting him and leaning upon him every day to meet our needs, that God will meet any and every need that we could ever have in life. I want you to understand that God Almighty in heaven, our Heavenly Father, who led us to embark on this uh, campaign, this 4G campaign, he knew before we ever began this project that uh, what we would need. He's aware of what we need to build these buildings and enlarge the facilities and to begin new ministries that we feel like God is, is, is telling us that we need to, to start. And listen, he knows all of those things, and it will be by his hand that we are accomplish anything. It is by the hand of Almighty God that we will build buildings, that we will enlarge ministries. It will be by His hand, not by our works, not by our goodness, not by our efforts. It will be by the grace and the goodness of a loving Father who has called us and given us commission to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as long as we're doing that, God Almighty in heaven will provide anything and everything we need. Amen? He will do that. But we must remember this great truth that God Almighty in heaven is our source of wealth regardless. That is the bottom line. God is the source of our wealth. Number one, it is important because God is the source of all things. Secondly, I'll give you a second reason why we should consider God as the source of our wealth. And this is taken from Bill Bright's men's manual. And I just want to quote him right here. He says, and I quote, All wealth is ultimately in God's hands since he controls the basic factors which affect our wealth. And he lists five basic factors that affects our wealth. Now I want you to think about these things. These are so good. Have you ever thought about these? Jot them down now because they're important. Five factors that affect your wealth and my wealth. Number one is this. God created natural resources and established natural laws. Did you get that? It's on the screen for you. God created natural resources and established natural laws. Now, what that simply means is this. The Bible says in Genesis 1.1, and now I'm adding my, my two cents worth in here. In Genesis 1.1, the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That means that God created everything that you and I see, everything that we experience. Uh, he, he created all the natural resources that we have. He's the one that, that, listen, God is the one that placed the sun in the sky to give us warmth. God is the and, 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 to, and to shine on the plants that need light and need oxygen. He gave us the oxygen to breathe. God is the one that created the oxygen of the air that you and I breathe. He's the one that created the fruits and the vegetables that we enjoy. He's even the one that created the animals that you and I eat from time to time. He created the meat that we have on our tables. God created all the natural resources that we have. And so it is because of Him. Listen, God is our creator, and He created all those natural resources. And just as He can create them and He can give them, he can remove them. If you don't believe it, look out west. Look at the drought that our nation has experienced over the last few years. The drought. Look at the rain that can be sent. Listen, do you understand that God has control of the weather? <laughs> He's the one that created it. Amen. God created the weather, and he can control it. And so, God, we must think about that. That is a factor in whether or not you and I make it. Did you know if there's a great drought, a, such a drought like this nation has never known, that farmers would not be able to raise crops? How can you raise crops without water? What if God was to cover up the sun? How could vegetables grow without the sunshine? Think about it. God created all the natural resources that we have, but not only that, he established all the natural laws that we have. You say, what are you talking about? Did you know that God has established some natural laws that we all live by every day? For example, the Bible tells us in the book of Galatians that here's a natural law that God has established. Are you listening? Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Do you know how true that is? If you just stop and think about it. That is a law that God has established, a natural law. He says... Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The Bible goes on to say that if we reap to our flesh, we, uh, if we sow to our flesh, 
then we will reap corruption. If we sow to our spiritual life, we will reap life everlasting. But whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you gossip about someone, I guarantee you, someone's going to gossip about you. That's just a natural law that God has given. Well, listen, about, listen at this. Did you know that God has also established a natural law in the realm of giving and receiving? Oh, really? Yes, listen to this. Listen, if you would, please. In 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, it says, But this I say, watch this now, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. What is that saying? It just says what it means, and it means what it says. It, it, listen, if I sow financially, if I sow sparingly, then I'm going to reap sparingly. But if I sow bountifully, I'm going to reap bountifully. Have you ever heard that old expression, you can never outgive God? Well, I think that's where that comes from. You, you, you can't outgive God. I don't care how much you give God. And, and, and when you, I say give to God, I mean when you give to others. You're, when you give into God's children and God's work and to missionaries and to, and to organizations that, that, that do the work of God, you're giving to God. And so when, when, we, when we give, when we sow bountifully, we're going to reap bountifully. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to reap a lot of financial stuff bountifully. That, that, that's not what they're saying. We'll reap a lot more other than just financial uh, and monetary things. We'll reap, reap spiritual blessings when we begin to sow bountifully in our life. And so God has placed that natural law. Just remember that as you think about your, your uh, resources and you think about what God has given you in your life and you think about your finances. Well, there's a second factor, and that is that God designed basic human needs. It's interesting to note that when God created man in the Garden of Eden, back in the book of Genesis, we read about the creation. When he created man, he knew that man needed an environment to survive. He created man out of the dust of the earth, and so what did God do? God created the Garden of Eden. He created this world, and he decided he would put man on this planet. And he created our environment so that we could survive and we could live in the environment in which God placed us. And so God placed us here on this earth and he placed man in a garden. It was a, it was a, it was a, um, it was a situation of complete perfection. Um, you know, and God placed man there and until sin entered the world, it was a place of perfection and man was in a stage of innocence. He had never known sin. But when sin entered the world, everything changed. And sin not only brought a curse on man and, and brought about sin on man's life and, and which brought death to all men, uh, but, but sin also affected the environment. It, it affected everything. And so God, but when God created man, he created man with certain basic human needs. We need food to eat and water to drink. We need clothes for our bodies. We need shelter to stay in out of the bad weather. Uh, we, there's a lot of different basic needs that we have. And by the way, you know, it would be interesting just to sit down and list basic needs. And I guarantee you a lot of us would, would list some things that really God would not consider to be basic needs because we are so accustomed to having more than what we need. We're, we're living, we're sort of like the nation of Israel. We're living in the land of plenty. And we've had so much for so long, that's why we're in the situation we're in today. It is because we have neglected God, we have become prideful, and we've become self-sufficient, and we've stopped depending on God. And that is exactly what God was warning the nation of Israel against. And remember what he said? He said, if you forget me, this is what's going to be the consequence. You're going to perish. And if, G if this nation, I'm going, to, I'm going to say this, if this nation doesn't turn around, and there's not a huge revival that takes place in this nation, and Jesus tarries, I want to tell you something. We are our worst enemy, and this nation is going down the tubes. It's already going down the tubes. It's just, it's just above the waterline right now, in my opinion. And it could be very soon that everything collapses. Now, I don't want to be a preacher of doom and gloom. I'm just telling the facts. We're living in some dangerous times, and things are tough in our nation, and they're not getting any better. But that is exactly what has happened. But God has designed basic human needs, and we all have those needs. 
in Matthew 6, 31 through 32, God warns us. Jesus said this himself. He says, be anxious. Don't, don't be worried about what you're going to wear, what you're going to put on your body, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. He said, don't worry about those things. And I'm paraphrasing that passage in Matthew 6, but that's what he's saying. He said, and he gives the example of the fowl of the air, the leaders of the field. He says, look at the fowls that, 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 of the air and look at the leaders of the field. They don't spin, they don't toil, they sow not, and yet your heavenly Father knows that they have need of, all, of, they, of their needs. He says, don't you understand that he, he loves you more than he loves all of those things? He's more concerned about you than he is the flowers of the field and the air, birds of the air. He said, so he'll provide. So don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to put on your body because your heavenly Father knows you have need of all those things. But then he says, this is the clincher, in verse 33 of that chapter, he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all of these things will be added unto you. So he says, here is a prerequisite. You want all of your needs met? You want me to, to, to bless you? financially and materially, he said, then seek me and my kingdom first. And well, what is God's kingdom? It's God's rule and reign in one's life, in one's heart. So he says, keep your heart focused on me, not on what you have. Keep your heart focused on me and, and, and love me and serve me and worship me more than you. Keep your heart focused on the things of this world. The Bible says in the book of 1 John that if we love the things of this world, the love of the Father is not in us. That we should not love the things of this world, but we should love God and serve Him. And He is to be first and foremost in our lives above all of the things, above all of the people. And so the key is to, to have a relationship with God. And when we have a relationship with Him, and that relationship is a priority in our life, God promises that we will have all the needs that He uh, that, that we need in life, all of those uh, basic human needs. Well, there's a third factor, and that is this, that God is the one that gives wisdom and inventive ability. You say, what do you mean? Listen to this verse, Proverbs 8, 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. Kay is sitting down here, and so is Joe. They're sitting down here with two iPads, and they're taking notes. You know, don't be critical of someone that, bring, that has their phone out during the service or has their iPad out because a lot of times they're reading their Bible off of their iPhone or iPad or they're taking notes. They're down here taking notes. I've got an iPhone in my hand, and I use this thing religiously every day. I, I keep up with everything I have to keep up with. I try to keep up with it anyway uh, on this phone. And it is amazing at the technology that is in this one little device. It's amazing that I can stand here with, with the Wi-Fi that we have available here in the sanctuary. I could stand here and I could, I could talk to anybody that I wanted to talk to that had Wi-Fi and, and could send me a text message or an email. A matter of fact, I could send an email somewhere on the other side of the world standing from right here. What amazing technology. I want to ask you a question. Who do you think gave man the knowledge to come, come up with this kind of technology? God did. All of this just didn't happen. I believe it was ordained of God. Because you see, it's through devices like this and through technology that we have today that we can now reach the world with the gospel. For the first time in human history, it is possible that we can reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's amazing how technology has escalated, how man's knowledge has escalated over the last few years. And by the way, I stated this in the, to the early service crowd, and I'll tell you, that tells me just one more reason why I need, to, I need to be listening because the trumpet's fixing to sound. The Bible says in the last days, in the very last days, that man's knowledge will escalate. And now, you know, pa preachers that preached many years ago that said, you know, that scripture where Jesus said that the world will hear the gospel before the end of time, it was never possible, and people couldn't understand how it could be possible until now. I'm reminded of a passage in the book of the Revelation where it talks about the two witnesses that are going to appear and how they're going to be killed and die in the streets and that people all over the world are going to be able to see it. That was not possible until just, just a few years ago. I'm telling you, folks, we better get our wedding garments on because the wedding's fixing to take place. Jesus is coming soon. But until he comes, you and I have got to be good stewards of what God has given us. And that means that we must be 
wise financial managers of that which he gives us. And the first step is to realize that God is our true source of wealth. And so God is the one that gives us wisdom and inventive ability. Number four, God sustains human strength and talent. God sustains human strength and talent. Uh, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, listen to this. And then I'm going to read a paraphrase of this passage. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. He says, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another, for who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? Now, let me give you a paraphrase of that. What are you so puffed up about? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all you have is from God, why act as though you are so great and as though you have accomplished something on your own? Because in essence, no one accomplishes anything on their own. Because you see, God is the one that sustains our strength and gives us the talents that we have. Do you know the Bible says in the book of Corinthians and in the book of Romans that God has given at least every Christian one spiritual gift? It's not a talent. It is a spiritual gift. And your gift and my gift is to be exercised in the body of Christ so that the body of Christ can accomplish the Great Commission and can do what Jesus Christ did when he was here on this earth. He said, I, you will come after me and you will even do greater things than I can do. And that has been true. And because of the technology, the wisdom, and the knowledge that God has given man, and because of the ability to travel and to reach more and more people, uh, groups throughout the world, that Jesus could not reach in one geographical area that he traveled back in those days. And so we're seeing that come true. But we can't be puffed up about what we do or what we are. We're nothing. I'm absolutely nothing. And I could not be standing here this morning had God not saved me and called me to the ministry and equipped me to teach and to preach His Word. I couldn't do that. Don't do a very good job of it to begin with, but I sure couldn't do any of it without God's help. Because God is the one that has gifted me. God is the one that has given me the strength to get up and to be here today. And so that is a, that is a factor that every single one of us must look at when we begin to think about how God is the source of our He's the true source of our wealth because if it wasn't for him, we would have nothing, we would be nothing, and we could do nothing. Well, there's one final factor that I want to mention, and that is this, that God, listen to this one now, God controls circumstances. God controls circumstances. And if God so chose, as I mentioned earlier, he could send a drought to our land, he could send a flood to our land, God could... Withhold whatever he needed to withhold. God controls circumstances. Let me give you a good biblical example. In 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7, uh, an example where God controls circumstances. There in that passage, uh, because of God's judgment on Samaria, there was a famine in the land. And at the same time, the Syrians were besieging Samaria so that the food supplies that they had at that particular time could not get into the city. And as a result of that, a donkey, listen to this, the Scripture says that a donkey's head had the value of 80 pieces of silver. A donkey's head. And in one day's time, God delivered the people of Samaria, Samaria, and the food was suddenly in abundance, and a donkey's head became absolutely worthless. Read it, chapter 6 and 7. So I can tell you, folks, God is the one that is in control of all our circumstances. And so when we think about it, God certainly is the true source of our wealth. Well, I want to mention a third reason why we need to consider him the true source of our wealth, and that is this. When, listen, if one believes one's wealth comes from natural resources, human ability, or success in work, whatever, one will attach loyalty and devotion to those things rather than to God. And that is exactly what God warned the nation of Israel about. He said, I'm the one that brought you out of bondage. I'm the one that led you through the wilderness, and I'm the one that is leading you into the promised land. But when you get there, and I'm blessing you with great possessions, and you're prospering, and you're, you're, things are happening, he said, beware, 
lest you become prideful and you think in your own heart and mind that you have done something when, it's, when, it, when I'm the one that has provided all of these things for you and led you to this wonderful land that you're going to enjoy. He said, be, be, be cautious, beware, lest you become prideful and beware lest you become self-sufficient and just because you're, you've got plenty, you stop praying to me and trusting me for what you need in life. I want to ask you a question this morning. And this, this question is to everyone here as well as to myself. How much do you and I depend upon God for our daily needs? I, I want you to be honest with yourself. When you get ready to purchase something, when you need something and you get ready to purchase something, do you ever just stop and pray and ask the Lord to bless you and help you and direct you in what you need to get? Do you know that he knows the best products on the market? Do you understand that he knows when things are on sale? Uh, listen, do you know that in this, this series, hold on, do you know that in this series I'm going to be teaching you some principles and truths that will help you to overcome all the advertisement that we are bombarded with every day? Because do you know what? The devil is out to get your money. The world is out to get your money. And you, you need to know how to combat those advertising campaigns that come out for all of those products, that the, the newest products you've got to have. Got to have it now. Guess what happens? These cell phone companies, they're making billions. You know how? They're coming out with new technology every year. Apple comes out with a new iPhone every year. They come out with a new iPad every year. And guess what? i got to have it. That's, what, that's how we are. We want the next fastest, bestest, if you please, thing that comes out on the market. And rather than praying about it, rather than really needing it, whatever, we just go buy it if we've got the money. We go buy it. Do we ever pray about it? Do we ever think, ask God, God, what do you want me to do in this? Do you want me to buy this thing? If we don't pray over what we buy and we don't pray about our monies and how we spend those monies and what we give to God and what we give to ourselves, and listen, I'm going to tell you, this is a very serious issue. It is a spiritual issue. It's not just a financial issue. It is a spiritual issue. And every single one of us, we're faced with it every day. And we need to know how to manage our finances. And so, you know, God does not want us to get attached to something or someone else. God wants us to be totally dependent upon him. And so that's why he said in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God in his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And so we need, listen, because God does not want us to be totally sold out and devoted to things or to other people, but totally sold out to him. There's a, and because you see what happens is when we start, when we start shifting our loyalty from, from him to things and to other people, three things happen. Number one, our trust is misplaced. Number two, our priorities will be out of balance. And number three, we'll become di disillusioned. We'll become disillusioned. And so we need to remember that it, when we believe that our wealth comes from these natural resources and human ability or, or whatever, and we're not trusting God, listen, it just shifts our loyalty from, from God to things. Well, there's a final thing, a fourth thing, and that is this. Fourth reason why you and I need to understand and need to live by this truth every day that God is the true source of our wealth. By tracing all wealth to God, we free ourselves to find security and true riches in our relationship with him rather than in things that will someday perish. Did you know that the greatest possession that you and I can have in this world is a relationship with Jesus Christ? You want to know why? I could give you many reasons why. But one of the main reasons, and put it in the context of what I'm talking to you about today, is because God Almighty in heaven can never be destroyed and he can never be taken away from you. If you, own, if you possess Jesus, you have the greatest possession you will ever have in your entire life. Because you see, that possession, possessing him as your Lord and your Savior, and him possessing you as his child, is the greatest relationship you can ever have. 
And that relationship will take you from this world into the next world, out of this world into a wonderful world of peace and perfection. And yet, you know, we, we spend so much of our time and our energy trying to figure out how we're going to make more money, how we're going to do this and how we're going to do that, when all along God the Father is sitting up there and he's saying, my child, I wish you'd just ask me about that. Why don't you just ask me about it? Because you see, God has all wisdom and he has all knowledge. He sees what we cannot see and what we do not see. As I mentioned the other Sunday, he sees over the hills and around the curves. We can't see that way, but God does. And it's wonderful to know that we can have a relationship with such a God, a God of love and mercy and grace and goodness and glory, a God that loves us with an everlasting love, a God that loved us so much that he was willing to send his only begotten son to this world to die for us on a cross that we could be set free from sin, from the bondage of sin and from the consequences of sin and be given eternal life so that we can live with him forever and ever. That's love. And so this morning, if you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I want to encourage you today, please put your faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for your eternal salvation, his finished work on the cross for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God wants you saved. He does not want one to perish, no, not one. And so if you're here today and you're lost without Jesus, God loves you and he wants to save you. He sent Jesus to die for you on the cross. And if you'll put your faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone and repent of your sins, uh, the Bible says that you can be saved and born again. If the Holy Spirit of God is drawing you, if the Holy Spirit is convicting you of your sin and the righteousness that is in Christ and the judgment that awaits you because of, listen, because of your lack to trust Christ or, or, or you're not trusting Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then listen, you need to come and you need to put your faith and your trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for your eternal salvation. And there's not a better place nor a better time than right here and right now to do that during this invitation this morning. And if you're here today and you're a believer and you know that you're saved, I want you to understand that if God doesn't, listen, if you're not surrendering your pocketbook to God and your bank account to God, then you do have a spiritual problem. And you need to get your priorities right. And there's not a better place to do that and not a better time to do that than right here and right now, today. And don't be ashamed. So I beg you, in the name of Jesus, do business with the Lord and leave here today always remembering this truth, that God Almighty in heaven, our Creator, and Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who is God, he is our creator as well, by the way. God Almighty in heaven is our true source of wealth. For without him, we would not have what we have, and we would not be where we are. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word today. I pray that you will bless your people with your word. I pray that we will not only hear the word, but we will heed the word we will be obedient to the word of God and Lord we will take what we've learned today and apply it to our hearts father thank you for your grace your goodness your greatness and your glory Lord may the world may the lost and dying world see your glory on our lives as we follow you on a daily basis. Bless this invitation and bless anyone that needs to be saved. Help them to come to the knowledge of the truth right where they are right now and help them to be willing to step out in faith and come down this aisle and say, I want Jesus as my Savior. And I am not, I'm not ashamed to claim him publicly as my Savior and my Lord. Father, give that person that may be on the verge of stepping out this morning, give them faith and give them courage and give them strength. And Lord, for that believer who desperately needs 
to align themselves back under the umbrella of your lordship. I pray, help them today to come home. And I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.